Hi. With the recent Weller video, I thought this one would be quite appropriate to have a look at. And it's a retro one. Take your mind back to 2005 when the original Xbox console reigned supreme. Hands up if you still got one and you're still using it. Anyway, there was a problem with the Xbox console. Unfortunately, about one in every 10,000, give or take, would release the magic smoke. So. It was a big deal at the time. Millions of boxes involved, apparently only like 30 of them uh, caught fire or smoked or melted down and did whatever. Microsoft actually seemed to do quite well at identifying uh, these problems and uh, owning up to them and fixing them. But in this particular case, they didn't recall the actual boxes and they didn't really specifically say what the issue was that was causing the problem with these things. All they did was saying, oh, we're going to for a voluntary recall of the power cord for this thing. So what they did is they shipped out millions of these things, these replacement power cords uh, to Xbox owners. You could uh, go onto the website and you could uh, request a new power cord. And I did this at the time and sure enough, they shipped me one of these power cords. So the reason I'm doing this video is because I'm still cleaning up the old lab and I came across this original replacement Xbox power cord in quote marks. It's actually an electronic fuse by the looks of it. And I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at this issue and do a teardown, which was designed to cut the power when uh, your power supply developed or whatever the problem was inside the unit actually developed a fault and rather than burn down it's like a fuse that Weller add to most of their products but let's not go there again now here's the original power cord again in quote marks that uh, Microsoft voluntarily replaced uh, there wasn't any like uh, like official like government um, like safety recall order or anything like that but they voluntarily re um, replaced the power cords on 14.1 million Xboxes and I don't know if that's uh, if that's how many they ship but that was uh, the potential impact of this thing so why did they replace a normal uh, power cord like this with this electronic fuse that has a reset button and a test mode? You, you press test on it and it flashes a few times and then the electromechanical cutout and you can see that there's a green uh, like mechanical uh, indicator in there which will then switch off. So why would you replace a normal cord with an electronic fuse like this? Well, the only reason is that it wasn't a faulty power cord. Now, Microsoft were very cagey about their actual wording for this thing, saying, oh, we're replacing the power cord and things like that. I think they kind of sort of admitted that there was an issue with the console. But anyway, um, they decided, I guess the console didn't have adequate or, uh, or any fuse in it so we'll do a teardown of an actual xbox uh, console shortly so stick around for that um, to have a look but they decided that rather than recall the consoles which could have been one way uh, to fix this problem that would have been expensive i mean if you recall 14.1 million xbox consoles like it's, it's cheaper just to design and manufacture this and just ship it out to people and problem fixed and you know guess there's nothing inherently wrong with that you've got to weigh up the costs of doing this i mean just imagine if the bomb cost and the shipping cost of this thing is ten dollars for example well that's 140 million bucks right there but it would have been much more expensive to actually and much more damaging to the brand etc and the xbox reputation all that sort of stuff actually recall units because apparently uh this all came about because only like 30 or 40 units actually caught on fire or smoked or melted down something like that microsoft actually came out and said that you had a one in ten thousand chance of it happening but the actual number of units that that the fault did actually appear in was actually much much smaller than that so anyway if anyone has any details on the you know the background for all this like actually inside information or something like that please do leave it in the uh, comments or over on the vlog forum anyway let's tear down this thing nominal 610 million it's not sure how accurate that is but uh it's made in China. It's got the C tick mark. Oh, it's all happening. Anyway, catalog number Q01. So let's tear it down. So obviously it's designed to trip at 610 milliamps or thereabouts.
Thankfully, it's got some screws. Let's get into it. Now, unfortunately, you can see the pain in the ass screw down there. It's one of those pentalobe type things with the security pin in the middle, and it's actually a large one. So I've only got like the smaller ones for like the newfangled uh, iPhone whatnoties. And uh, well, I drilled out the screws and check this out. It is phenomenally complicated for an electronic fuse, which is basically all it is. Unbelievable. <laughs> Look at all the control circuitry on here. I'm just absolutely stunned. We've got two 8-pin uh, jobbies on here. They're probably little micros. Might have a close look at those in a minute. So that's your test switch. That's your reset switch. And you can see that that physically um, uh, pushes that green uh, indicator, that mechanical green indicator. Why you'd go to all that effort for this mechanical green indicator and have all this molded plastic stuff it's absolutely remarkable got a massive mov there by the looks of it you can just picture the uh <laughs> design meeting for this and the poor scared little engineers in there that are, and they're going don't screw this up otherwise bill bill himself's going to come here and personally kick your ass <laughs> this is like hilarious um yeah they've just gone to so much effort and even like all these dedicated plastic mounts to mount the board on and everything else it's just Insane. I mean, you know, they could have just put a fuse in a lead if they really wanted to. And look at this. Taking off that plastic cover, look, they're breaking both the active and the neutral there. Like, unbelievable. The amount of complexity they've gone into doing all that. Little solenoid in there. And it looks like they've got a low voltage uh, transformer here for powering various stuff. They would have got that right, I'm sure, with all the requisite approvals. They would have been very careful with everything in this thing because they didn't want to screw it up. Anyway, let's have a look at how they're actually doing the current trip in here. Now, it looks like they've got two current transformers here. This one here, some windings down there inside that pot in down in there, and they come out these brown wires down to this chip down here. We'll have a look at that in a minute. And then they've got this other one. You can see the windings more clearly in that one. That one's not actually potted in place. That one looks like it has much finer and much higher number of uh, turns in there. And that's just like a regular PCB mount uh, current transformer there. Got a diode bridge rectifier. We'll look at that for the uh, transformer in a minute. But look at how the mains current goes here. Why do they need two? if they're just doing simple current sensing. Now this first current transformer here has both the primary, the brown wire, and the black wire running through it. That does not make sense for measuring uh, the current of the product under test because the, if the current's flowing this way through the uh, active brown wire and then back this way through the uh, black neutral wire, then they cancel each other out and you can't measure anything. So, but this is a classic configuration for a earth leakage circuit breaker or a current balance transformer. So if there's any imbalance between the current, between the primary and the secondary here, then it will uh, generate a magnetic field, which can be sensed on the coil, and then it trips at a certain current. So that's how an earth leakage Circuit breaker works. Now, we've got this extra winding, which we'll have a look at in a minute, but obviously they're doing some earth leakage circuit breaker functionality. So uh, rather than just the 610, obviously they wouldn't be doing 610 milliamps in terms of uh, earth leakage uh, current there. That's way like above, like the standard is like 20 milliamps or 30 milliamps. So obviously that's the primary current that they're tripping the electronic fuse at, 610 milliamps. So they don't mention anything about um, earth leakage breaker inside here, but they're obviously taking no chances. So this thing has dual functionality. Now, if you have a look at the second transformer, it now makes sense. The black wire, the neutral avoids going through that and they've only got the active passing through it. So obviously this current transformer is measuring the uh, product consumption current from the active goes out to your Xbox and then if current comes back and then avoids that. So we're measuring the current taken by the Xbox. So that one is doing your current sensing and the circuitry on the back, it looks like and that's gonna bugger off to your control board here 
there's a track on top. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a track that goes from the pin of that current transformer over to that board. So there you go. It's got dual functionality. Wow, I didn't expect that. So what's going on with this white wire here that's all wrapped around and buggers off down here? Well, obviously this is the test functionality. So that because it's going through the primary current measurement uh, transformer here, they're obviously going to put a load on this thing and then test out both the uh, product current, the electronic fuse trip current, and also the uh, earth leakage circuit breaker as well. Because you can see there's a couple of turns wrapped around there like that and then it bugs off down to here and down to this relay down here which is a nice omron jobby <laughs> spared no expense really spectacular spared no expense and then it goes through these three 1206 resistors that's to get the uh, voltage uh, requirement so three of those in series and here are the two contacts on the coil and then the contacts just go off to to the neutral pin down the bottom and of course the uh, top side of that is connected to the active after this transformer here so they're obviously just putting those three resistors directly across active and neutral with that relay and that's designed to um, test uh, both the earth leakage circuit breaker via these couple of loops here which give you more current uh, by the way so it like magnifies the uh, current going through there and also by putting a small amount of increased current into the uh, main current measurement transformer. But how small? Well, we're only talking, these are three 18K resistors in series. So we're only talking like four odd milliamps or something. So obviously they're not testing at the full load because if you want to test at the full load, you need a massive power resistor, especially like for the 610 milliamps, a massive power resistor or a, a varistor or something like that. Now I know there's a lot of stuff on there, but you know, surely you would have, as a first pass, you would have tried to integrate that onto the main board down there. Maybe, you know, I know they've got to keep the size down, but geez, you think they could have some, I mean, it's double-sided populated anyway, although it's only through hole on the top, I guess, but still, it's almost maybe like, you know, two separate design teams. You know, one worked on this, uh, this test controller, the other one, worked on the rest of it or something and then they had to integrate them together but it's it's just seriously com complex and unbelievable son of a bitch medium microchip <laughs> what does that mean i i don't <laughs> is that like an in joke there's our lead and the microchip fanboys go wild that's a 12f675 they had some sort of um, a marker pen on top of that obviously to show that it's uh, been programmed and then elsewhere we just have a uh, LM358 op amp so a little 8 pin micro jobby just controlling that uh, test functionality oh that's SO8 <laughs> that makes sense it's not SOB <laughs> but maybe <laughs> that's what they refer to it internally as I'm sure now, if I was designing this and wanted it to be reliable, I wouldn't be doing the detection of that 610 milliamps in software in the micro. I wouldn't be relying on that micro to then, like uh, the ADC, measure it, continually measure it, and then trip it. Not only is it, uh, well, it's going to be slower, still going to be fast enough, of course, for the application, but then you add an extra layer of uh, unreliability in there. As, as reliable as these are, every extra process you add in there. So I'm wondering, is there any like analog functionality and all of this other, the micro and everything else is just doing the test functionality perhaps. So the active stuff might be done analog wise. So we certainly do have lots of discrete transistors on here and stuff. And of course we've got the op amps and things like that. So it could certainly, the thresholds could certainly be done in hardware but then what do you do for different regions you're going to need different test currents so if you did it analog wise you would have to change some of the values of the resistors and you can see the microcontroller has the test pads up here so obviously this is programmed in circuit and it wouldn't surprise me if uh, that had different programming for different regions for the different uh, required test currents all right let's just run this i'll push the test switch test it use my poker here Hey! <laughs>
I'm talking about belt and braces engineering, a ZNR series uh, MOV in here, big ass trans orb. And if, if that's not enough, coupled thermally to a thermal fuse, 105 degrees C thermal fuse. At what point in like the engineering cycle do you go, well, you know, yeah, we've got a MOV in there, but we want to have a thermal fuse in series with that, just in case the MOV heats up and gets too hot. What? Like, I got <laughs> my kingdom to be a fly on the wall at the safety review meeting for this thing. <laughs> because, well, you know, look, Hundreds of millions of dollars are on the line for this thing. You've got to remember that. And, you know, the brand, the Xbox brand that's worth billions and billions of dollars is all on the line. And if they don't get it right, you know, <laughs> so the pressure on the engineers to over-engineer the shit out of this would have been, yeah, pretty intense. And that's what they've done. I mean, this is just massively over-engineered. So there's a fuse in series with the mob and they've like, run a wire over a jumper link directly over here. It's not an afterthought, really, but, you know, why they couldn't have snaked the traces on there clearance-wise? They could have just slotted that out, I guess. But anyway, um, yeah, directly across the mains input before any of the uh, switching happens in here. So obviously our test button that uh, goes in the back here pushes up these armatures, it latches in place, and then they activate this uh, solenoid to actually um, switch it, you know, to deactivate or, or trip the thing, basically. So that solenoid is connected under here. You'll notice that's going over there. It's going over to, looks like, is that a little solid state relay jobby? No, that's actually just a bridge rectifier down in there. Here's the neutral over here going into the solenoid here. Then the solenoid goes into the uh, AC side of the bridge rectifier. And then the bridge rectifier comes out. Here's your DC out. So they've got a little transistor in there. And so they're... What? CR03AM. No, it turns out that's a thyristor. So... <laughs> they're using that to switch the solenoid. That's rather interesting, isn't it? And they've just got a varista in series with that to protect it. But yeah, um, thyristor control of the solenoid. Huh. And what do you know? That's a dedicated uh, earth leakage breaker chip. But you'll notice that the coil goes through the bridge rectifier between active and neutral there. And the thyristor is on the other side of that bridge rectifier there. So it's got it's not actually switching the coil like directly across that. That's not how it works. If you look at the uh, typical application circuit for our earth leakage circuit breaker chip here, we've got our bridge rectifier, okay? Here's our contacts over here. Here's our solenoid to drive it. So there's our thyristor there as part of this latch circuit here. And that solenoid, of course, drives the contacts. But that's, that's not what we see here. Look, this is neutral. Goes through the bridge rectifier, through the coil, to active. It's just permanently Enabled. That solenoid is permanently enabled across that mains. How else does it get driven? It's bizarre. So I've traced this out here, and this middle pin is the anode of the thyristor. We're talking about this point up here. Instead of it going to the solenoid, which makes perfect sense, it doesn't. It goes through these four resistors here in series going over to pin 8 of the chip, the power pin. So those four resistors are obviously the 50k there. So of course we're getting our, you know, our 240 volts um, AC rectified across uh, this full wave uh, bridge rectifier here. So we're getting our 240 volts on there. That's why we need those four resistors in series, high voltage, doing a direct mains powering of this chip here and it's got a built-in regulator it's uh, designed to do this so no problems whatsoever but where's the solenoid where's wally it's directly across active and neutral permanently i swear i must be going nuts and i have confirmed that uh, that is correct the gate goes over to pin seven here as part of the latch circuit I've confirmed that, and the other, uh, the cathode, um, of course, goes down to ground. So that's exactly the same. 
But instead of that coil there, this just connects directly to that. There is no coil. It shorts out the output of the bridge rectifier. So instead of having our solenoid here, that it's installed directly in series with the AC side of the bridge rectifier there. That's it. There doesn't seem to be any other way to activate that solenoid. I'm going nuts. I think I'll go start a Jim's mowing franchise. Okay, so the only way this thing can work, look what happens. The solenoid, okay, is normally off like this because like you've got 240 volts on here. So comes through here, there's no way that it can go anywhere else, right? Because it's just it's just going through and powering the circuit here. So if the thyristor shorts out this point here and this point here, bingo, we've got a short across there. Bingo, you suddenly have a path for the current to flow through that diode, through here, through there, and back like that, activating the solenoid and disconnecting the circuit. So it's like they're doing it completely opposite to what the um, application circuit for this chip says. But that certainly explains why they've got that varistor in there. Aha! Because, like, you know, you don't want the full mains across that. You want a varistor in series to then go high resistance as it uh, heats up, but you only need the solenoid to activate for, you know, a split second, and then, bingo, cuts off the power. So you could say, actually, that's a rather clever variation on this classic application circuit, which no doubt the designers would have seen. They would have had the uh, data sheet, just like I've got for this chip, which has this application uh, note on the very first page. And it looks like they're doing it almost uh, identically, except for the fact that they haven't bothered to put the solenoid here. They've actually put it in series with the bridge rectifier and then once it trips shorts out the bridge rectifier cuts its own power off because once this bridge rectifier uh sorry shorts out across here of course then then there's no more power on the rail up here and the switch chips uh, switches off the thyristors off everything's off so it just goes bam but why they've decided to do that over the standard implementation with the uh solenoid coil here i don't know I'll let you guys fight it out in the comments. Go for it. As for the solenoid activation, let's push this lever all the way with LBJ right down to the bottom. Push that in like that, and that, that holds it in place until the solenoid releases and the whole thing flips up. And what is this transformer doing? Well, it's just a little uh, uh, low power transformer just to power the electronics. It's connected directly across the mains there just goes over to the other side here and then that just powers the uh, this board so this is the AC mains input here goes into the AC side of the full wave bridge rectifier there the other side of that buggers off to one pin of the module and the other ones over here go through here over to here so this can find its way back certainly find its way back into um, the main earth leakage circuit breaker tree. So obviously, you know, you've got to have two paths. One's got to come from the uh, test board. Uh, logic control has to be able to trip it. So it's obviously has that extra path through there to do that. So let's just have a quick look inside the Xbox, shall we? Got to get all this cage stuff out before we can access the mains down here because there's going to be something to do with the mains input. And take out the hard drive, we're into the power supply, a totally separate board of course as you'd expect. Very nice construction inside the Xbox by the way, very well designed, nice uh, use of the envelope. But avid Therm Alloy, oh for all you avid fanboys, there you go. Um, they got those in the right direction for the fan here, if you had them in the other direction they wouldn't work, you wouldn't get the airflow across them. It's made by Foxlink Technologies, made in China. It, uh, Looks pretty good. Single-sided uh, board, of course, as you'd uh, expect in all of these uh, ones. But uh, that looks uh, nicely laid out, nicely designed. It's got a Tipo main cap there. Jeez, haven't seen Tipo for a what, what happened to Tipo? Still around? Probably. Anyway, nice common mode choke there. There's your full wave bridge rectifier. There's your uh, suppression cap. No worries whatsoever. On the backside here, we've got our mains input directly across here. The clearances are just fine. Everything's hunky-dory there. No problems whatsoever. They've got decent amount of clearance between 
there. I, I can't fault that at all. Looks like a standard 240 switch mode supply. So I got, got no issues with that. But let's look at the protection. And there's our protection, 2.5 amps. It, it'd be different for the 110. Looks like they've got a MOV in there. Don't know, they've got a resistor across that to uh, bleed any uh, residual when you pull the cord out. So that's nice. Everything's hunky-dory. There has been speculation that there was bad soldering joints on these. And that's what would uh, heat up and uh, start, you know, catch the fire and everything else. But of course, those joints look fine. And of course, you'd expect them to be fine. <laughs> My, just the one random unit that I opened that dates from uh, 2002, by the way, then uh, if the random sample was out, then you'd expect uh, a much higher fire rate than the expected one in 10,000 that Microsoft claim, or even, you know, point, what is it, triple O two percent actual field failure rate. So of course, you know, the odds of us actually seeing anything in here was zip. Yeah, the only real issue there is the strain relief is just these two little plastic clips like that. Um, there is no other way to hold that except for the two solder joints and these little plastic clips. So every time some kid comes along and goes wham, look at that. You can see the plastic in there wiggle like that. The rest of that strain and stress is going to be taken on those solder joints. Well, there's your problem. But there could be two issues here. You know, they do mention maybe some sort of component failure, but the component could include the PCB, the soldering, uh, the assembly, whatnot. A 2.5 amp fuse on 240 volts, that's 600 watts. Yeah, I think that was just a uh, badly specced fuse, which would have been like, it's okay for like gross overloads and gross shorts and stuff like that. It needs to be over 2.5 amps for a significant amount of time for it to blow. It just doesn't magically blow it uh, instantly at 2.5 amps. That's not how fuses work. They're a, uh, you know, a th there's a thermal delay mechanism plus uh, some tolerance added in there. So, so with hindsight in that, there might have been some sort of uh, solder joint fire in here that was drawing power, causing these to heat up and even, in the odd case, uh, catch fire. That 2.5 amps um, wasn't specced well enough to do that. But of course, as I said, recalling all of these, all the Xbox units to replace that fuse, meh, nah, it was much cheaper to simply supply an external one. So Microsoft just went, ah, bugger it, look, <laughs> after extensive testing, I'm sure they would have determined that 610 milliamps was the optimal trip point for the, uh, you know, the 230, 240 volt market unit. They determined we will protect these Xboxes and stop them melting down if that particular fault, whatever it is, which they're probably keeping very close to their chest, happened. It's like it's been like 13 years at least now. Has the, has the truth come out? I don't know if it has, please leave it in the comments. Well, not only do we need a fuse in there, let's make it electronic. And hey, while we're at it, let's let's add some uh, earth leakage circuit breaker as well. Just belt and braces approach. Anyway, um, they came up with this, <laughs> no doubt, very expensive and massively over-engineered response to this particular fault, which is very fascinating. It, you know, might be a classic example of, you know, <laughs> there's a lot on the line. As I said, billions of dollars on the line and the engineers have to get it right. So they decided, well, belt and braces, when we're, we're taking no chances, we're going to over-engineer the crap out of this. And they did. And when I thought, oh, I'll do a quick tear down of this. Sorry, it's been like half an hour or something now. Dry joint, crack joint on, a, on the ACN, which is pretty important. Uh, the buzzing noise we were hearing was uh, probably the arcing of that to the actual board. That, that was fascinating. So if you liked the video, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, you can discuss down below if anyone actually worked on this for Microsoft at the time and now you can uh, talk about it, then please let us know. But I hope you enjoyed that fascinating look at some retro safety engineering to avoid a product recall. It still cost them hundreds of millions of dollars though. <laughs> Caused them a couple of hundred million bucks and that's not counting reputation, everything else. <laughs> Shit happens. Catch you next time.